Before I start, I want to express my personal appreciation for the organizers of this conference. I think they've done a fantastic job. And also for the 3,265 people who helped put it all together. Thank you very much. What? Oh, I, wait a moment. Oh, 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 good. OK. Are you ready? I have great news for you. It comes in three parts. The first is, mathematics is beautiful. The second, now that I've met all of you, you are beautiful. And the third, and most important, nothing else matters. <laughs> We'll start, we'll start with mathematics. Uh, I have to tell you what mathematics is, because I think uh, some of you may not know that it's more than just numbers. I think of mathematics as applied logic. So anything that you can reason about categorically, that is, where you can make statements that have to be true, because logic forces them to be true, that's mathematics. And that includes all kinds of things that already give you pleasure. Puzzles. Toys, games, origami, dance steps, magic tricks, ooh, 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 um, fractals. And that's there to remind me that, to tell you that when I talk about the beauty of mathematics, I'm talking about inner beauty. It's not the visual beauty. Now, of course, that is visually beautiful. It's terrifyingly beautiful. But, but mathematics, it, it's internal. I mean, if you take that and you blow it up and look at it more detailed, you'll see amazing things. The more you explore it, the more you see. If I, if I want to explain to you the beauty of mathematics, the best way to think about it is to think about mathematics as an art. Now, as an art, you can, you can appreciate it the same way you appreciate other arts. If you love a poem, you'll read it over and over and get more out of it each time as you learn more about the poet and, and the thoughts expressed. If you love a piece of music, you'll play it again and again. It will, it will run through your head. It will live with you, and you will live with it. In the same way, if you fall in love with a mathematical object, you want to play with it. You want to explore it. You want to find out its hidden secrets. You will live with it, and it will live with you. I'll talk more about that later. But another point about mathematics being an art is that you have choice. You don't read every book. You choose the books that you read. You choose the movies you go to. You choose the pictures that you put on the wall. In the same way, as mathematics is an art, you should be able to choose the mathematics that you look at. Ooh, I like that. I don't like that. Get that away. I never want to see that again. <laughs> you should be allowed to do all those things, because mathematics is an art. Now, I suspect that some of you had teachers that didn't let you choose. You. <laughs> You had to learn the, the multiplication table. You had to learn how to add fractions. You had to do trigonometry, all those things, OK? What do I have to say to that? I have an answer for that. Nothing else matters. <laughs> I'll get to that in a moment. But right now, it's you I want to talk about. You, because you are beautiful. Now, of course, um, just as with mathematics, I'm talking about inner beauty, you know, not visual beauty. <laughs> I hope I haven't misled you. Uh, for inner beauty, uh, are there any uh, mathematical geniuses here? Oh, no? Oh, well, um, I have a surprise for you. Each of you was born with the mental equipment to become a genius. Each of you. I, I, it looks as though some of you didn't become geniuses. <laughs> <clears throat> but don't blame yourself. 
It's all about love. A genius is somebody who fell in love with mathematics, probably at an early age, uh, and just kept thinking about mathematics. Because if you think about mathematics, you get smarter. If you really love mathematics, you'll think about it a lot, and you'll get really, really smart. That's a genius. The person may not say anything about what they're thinking. Uh, a friend of mine, a brilliant mathematician, maybe not a genius, but a brilliant mathematician, uh, as a child, he was known as somebody who had no conversation. He couldn't add to the discussion. People would talk around him, and he would nod and smile, but he didn't, add, didn't say much. But you know why, of course. He was always thinking about mathematics. And there's a story in his family. His mother once uh, said, OK, I'm going to take you out to dinner, and we're going to have a conversation. So she took him out to dinner, and she talked at him, and she asked questions and tried to draw him out, but he wouldn't say much. He just wouldn't say much. And, and he ate his dinner and smiled and nodded. And finally, she gave up and said, well, we have to go home. You have to do your math homework. Oh, no, I've been doing it. It's all done now. <laughs> and I have to tell you that the, uh, the, 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 the smartness you get from mathematics is good for anything. I'll get, I'll get to that more later. Nothing else matters. Oh, oh. Well, that teacher who, who made, you, made you do uh, the multiplication tables and, and made you do uh, addition, you still know how to add fractions. <clears throat> That was all. She, she or he uh, had your best interest at heart, trying to give you knowledge. That's what schools historically are for, to give you knowledge. You go to college to get knowledge. You need it because this is a knowledge economy, right? Wrong. Things have changed, and they've just changed in recent years. But right now, knowledge is cheap. Knowledge is on the internet. You can. You can research any question by going on the internet. So if you don't need knowledge, what do you need? You need smarts. You need intelligence. We need people who can ask the right questions. We need people who can make sense of the knowledge that you get from the internet. We need people who can find meaning in data. How on earth are we going to find smart people? Well, it's all about love. If they fall in love with mathematics, they'll think mathematics. If they think mathematics, they'll get smart. Isn't that wonderful? And that smartness is good for anything. Uh, that smartness, it's, it's really, it's, it's how to solve problems. It's problem solving abilities. And, and that goes, transcends mathematics. It's for, you can use it for solving social problems. You can use it for solving economic problems, political problems, anything. Um, I know a, a woman who had a PhD in mathematics. I think her field was number theory. She had uh, a postdoc at MIT. And when that postdoc ended, she had her choice of any academic position she wanted. And what did she choose? She joined a hedge fund. <laughs> she knew nothing of finance. She knew nothing of economics or business. But the hedge fund wanted her because she was smart. Have I convinced you? <laughs> I'm telling you that you have the mental equipment to become a genius. You could, if you wanted, be a genius with no conversation. Or be like me, a pleasure seeker. <laughs> a mathematical voluptuary. <laughs> well, uh, if I haven't convinced you, let me tell you about an experiment I conducted. Uh, I taught a course at Smith in Mathematics as an art. And 
there were no prerequisites for that course. So the students in that course knew no more mathematics than any of you. Furthermore, Smith um, has no mathematics requirement. And a lot of students choose Smith because that means they'll never have to take a math course. <laughs> and so I want to tell you that the students in my class were certainly no more confident than any of you. OK? So let's see how those students did. I gave them freedom. I told them, no matter what you do, I'm going to give you an A, all of you. And it doesn't matter what you do in this course. If you're about to retire, you can do things like that. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and I gave them agency. I said, I'll give you lots of interesting mathematics. There's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And I didn't tell them, you have to work on this today or that today. I gave them the choice. They could choose whatever they wanted, because I wanted them to fall in love. You see, this course was about romance. <laughs> the typical math course is about arranged marriage. <laughs> So how did they do? Well, they fell in love. And when they fell in love, I said, now, you've been looking at these mathematical objects. Can you create some yourself? Can you be a mathematical artist? And they did. OK. This was a religion major. She looked like, took a circles of numbers like that. And she looked at the differences between the numbers as you go around the circle. And that gave her another set of, another circle of numbers. And then she found the differences there, and that gave another circle of numbers. And she kept on going, and she saw interesting patterns. She wanted to find out more. She tried, you know, this was five. She tried other numbers, all kinds of things. She, she fell in love with this. She explored it. She lived with it, and it lived with her. Now, I'll tell you. It turns out that this mathematical object was actually discovered about, about uh, 80 years ago. And some hundred papers, mathematical papers, have been written about it. I didn't know that. She didn't know it. She was a religion major. <laughs> Any of you could have found this, too. Had you been in my class, you might have found these. You're just as smart as she is. Another student, she invented this puzzle. And some of you saw this puzzle. Um, and this is the Save the Sheep puzzle. Um, the, the challenge is to draw a fence where all the sheep are on one side, and the fence borders each sheep on two sides. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the unique answer. This puzzle came to the attention of Donald Knuth. Uh, you may not know him, but he is both the father and the grandfather of computer programming, an extremely important computer scientist and mathematician. He saw this. He fell in love, too. He started making his own Save the Sheep puzzles. And Save the Sheep is going to appear in his next book. And you know what I'm going to say next. Any of you, <laughs> any of you could have. Now, you, you, you look at this and you might say, well, uh, but of course, how could, I mean, that, that, it's so complicated. And how did she figure this out? And so on. We don't figure things out in mathematics. We try things. And if they don't work, we try something else. She tried lots of things until she found something that was gorgeous. You can do that, too. I know you can. And one more. I, I find this extraordinary. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, um, this East Asian studies major, uh, she invented a, a solitaire game that uses only nine cards. And I think some of you were playing that solitaire game in the workshops. Uh, so there it is. Uh, and for those of you who didn't, you deal out the nine cards. And you're, you're, this goal is to arrange them in order. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the way you do it is you pick some card. That's a three. And then you can move three steps, left, right, up, down. 
Uh, and wherever you land, you can switch the two cards. That's one move. Can you, can you get it into the right, right, right order, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, in eight steps or fewer? That's how you win the game. Now this, this is just a beautiful mathematical object. It has two important mathematical aesthetics. One is simplicity and the other is complexity. Simplicity, it's simple to explain. Complexity, because it, it has a complex structure. Figuring out each time how to do this, and it may not be possible, uh, is, is a, a, a great challenge. How many speakers end their talk by saying, go out and fall in love and then have fun? <laughs> but that's my recipe for success. And I hope that all of you will find your happiness with some consenting mathematical object. 